my name is Liz Dunn, and I'm with the Career Strategies Office at Thomas R. Klein uh, School of Law, Drexel University. I want to welcome you to our Career Exploration Series, the Public Interest Edition. Um, after one of the things you hopefully heard about Drexel, or you know about Drexel if you're an admitted, if you're a student here, is how much we value our community, what a great community we have. And this alumni panel we have with us today is um, just an incredible example of that. Uh, these are very accomplished attorneys uh, who are here to talk to you about the important work they do. Um, they just really stay connected to the community and, and are a part um, of our experience. So I'm thrilled to have them all here today. And uh, I'd like to start by asking them to introduce themselves and uh, please tell our students and admitted students a little bit about your work um, and what you did before you came maybe into the position that you're at right now. So Rosa, why don't we start with you? Good evening, everyone. Um, I am Rosa Parks Green. I'm excited to be here to talk with you all tonight um, about uh, public interest and um, how um, some of this work um, you may be interested in. Um, so um, a little bit about me. Um, I am a uh, class of 2013 graduate from Drexel. Um, and after law school, I went and worked for the city of Philadelphia for their law department working in child welfare. So I represented the Children and Youth Agency in family court um, and did a lot of litigation um, <clears throat> in representing the city in that regard. Um, after a couple of years, I left there and I worked for the School District of Philadelphia um, as an attorney there, um, doing a lot of student right issues, overseeing um, code of conduct violations, um, and doing a lot of um, policy uh, change and reform, and also working a lot with our students and foster care um, and making sure that the school district was compliant with the rules and regulations as it pertained to those students. Um, and most recently, um, I started a new position at Temple University working in the Office of Equal Opportunity Compliance, um, doing investigations for um, allegations of discrimination and harassment and overseeing their affirmative action compliance. Um, so that's a little bit about me and I hope that um, you can learn a bit, little bit more throughout this presentation. Hi, I'm Lauren McCulloch. I am a 2016 grad of Drexel. Um, I was interested in public interest before I went to law school. So I had interned with the Senior Law Center as part of me choosing whether pursuing law school was right for me. So I had a little foray into the Philly public interest community and was really impressed with how um, collegial the team, like, all the different agencies worked together and people were interested about retaining good people into that group. Um, so when I graduated from law school, I took a fellowship with the Georgetown Women's Law and Public Policy Fellowship Program with a placement at the National Partnership for Women and Families in their reproductive health group. Say that 10 times fast. Um, so I worked on policy around um, unfettered access to reproductive health care, both at the national, like national states, but nationally and at the federal level. And then I figured out that I was interested in litigation and wanted to get back to Philadelphia from DC and accepted my position at the um, at Women Against Abuse, where I represent people experiencing intimate partner violence in protection from abuse cases and any associated custody and support cases. Bob Alexander here. Uh, I'm a 2016 grad. Before law school, I spent about 22 years, three months and 11 days in the Air Force and um, decided I wanted to continue my public service. And I was familiar with the law because both my parents are attorneys and try sitting around the dinner table with dad every night. Uh, eventually it kind of seeps into you. So I decided to use the law uh, to try to help others. And while I was at Drexel, I participated in a lot of, in many, if not all the clinical opportunities. I did the appellate litigation clinic. Um, I did uh, an externship at the ACLU of Pennsylvania. I did a summer uh, externship or co-op at uh, the National Law Center for, on Homelessness and Poverty in Washington, DC. And while I was in law school, I was trying to figure out um, you know, where I might fit in in the, in the public interest realm. Uh, I myself being a gay American, I'm kind of interested in uh, LGBTQ Americans and the intersections uh, that they kind of encompass. And I found that I really could not find much about 
LGBTQ veterans anywhere in any source. And I thought that must either mean one, they're taken care of and doing fine, or two, um, they're being missed. So I uh, decided to pursue that and I pitched a um, fellowship project with Equal Justice Works Foundation uh, to do a, a LGBTQ veteran legal outreach project here out here. I'm, in, I'm out here in San Francisco with Source to Plowshares, which is a great um, uh, regional veteran multi-service organization. Anyway, I got picked up for the fellowship and I finished two years and I was just picked up as a staff attorney at Source of Power Shares in September. Hello, I'm Jamie Hatcher. I am not technically the oldest as I was corrected um, before we got on, but law school wise, I'm the oldest person on the panel. I am um, a member of the 2010 graduating class, which is the second graduating class from, from Drexel. And I've been a part of all the name changes um, to this point. Uh, and I'm the executive director of Christian Legal Clinics of Philadelphia, which is a Christian legal aid organization based in, in the city of Philadelphia, thus the name. Um, and so what we do is we provide free legal representation and consultation to people within the city. And our model is a neighborhood based model. So we have eight clinics in eight different neighborhoods throughout the city in Chester. And so our goal is to meet the clients where they are. And we do this by partnering with local churches and Christian organizations for them to provide the space and, and technically the street cred with the people who are in the neighborhood. And then we come in and we provide the legal resources and also spiritual follow-up for, for the clients. And so I'm, I'm happy to be here with you guys. I'm actually, actually have clinic going on tonight because we're in the virtual model. Um, so we have clients being seen right now as, as we're meeting. So I'm taking time from that so that I can participate in this with you guys. Thank you, Jamie. We appreciate it. Um, I think when students are interested in public interest, they know they want to do mission driven work. They know they want to you know, help people and make changes. Um, but I think they often don't know that there's lots of different ways that you can do that and lots of different skills and finding out what that looks like and how you fit your own skills. You're all in slightly different roles. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the skills that you have that make you a good fit for that work. So um, for one, working um, at the school district, you have to have a love for kids. Um, and you know that's really important um, because the work that you do should always be child focused and centered. So thinking about what's in the best interest of the child. Um, although as, as adults, sometimes we sit around the table and we think what we feel might be best, um, you really have to be child focused in that regard um, and think about the children. So um, I would definitely say, um, you know, that that would be something that you definitely would want to have. Um, and also, um, I want to interact with people, um, you know, whether it's Philadelphia School District or whatever school district it is, um, you're going to have to want to work collaboratively with people um, and have a desire to help um, help people and to, to service people. I think working in public service, one of the things that I always say is that, um, you know, you are a public servant. And so when I see people and encounter people, you know, my response is, how can I help you? Um, what can I do to help or support? Um, and so um, having that mentality um, is really important in working in um, public service. Um, and then the ability to adapt to change. Um, I think that it's really important to, um, you know, sometimes think outside of the box or step out of what might have been the tradition um, and really use that as a, um, a leverage to want to make change um, for the better and for the good. So um, those are just some things I think that might be helpful. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about when you were doing policy work specifically, what did that look like the actual day to day of doing it? Sure. Yeah, so um, at this school district, the policy work that I was doing surrounded a lot with policies specifically that pertain to students and student right issues. So um, that included everything from our student code of conduct, which every year um, the school district works to revamp, as well as um, other um, student right, I guess, issues or concerns. Um, so like, um, 
Um, I'm trying to think of some of the policies. So like policies surrounding students in foster care, um, some of the policies surrounding our students who identify as LGBTQ um, and making sure that those students um, felt supported. So what that would look like is getting a work group together of um, students, faculty, um, administrators, having conversations about um, you know, what they feel would be best to change or um, alter the policy. Um, and then taking that and then talking with um, also other school districts or other people in similar roles to kind of um, piece out what they're doing, um, how it may compare to, you know, on the, you know, um, regional level or national level, how those policies compare to other school districts um, and like situations. Um, so I think that um, that wasn't always like a day-to-day -day thing, but it definitely was something that we did on the regular, looking at policies that affect students and making sure that we're getting input from all stakeholders. I know you're doing a lot of direct service client, you know, building that trust piece as well. Can you talk about that? The good skills that, that make me, and I think any attorney that has worked with us and that do currently work with us is, is just the ability to listen first um, when dealing with our clients. Our clients come in and they have a boatload of life that's on their shoulders that they have to actually sort through before you can get to their legal issue. And letting them know that you're actually present there and you're willing to listen to their life before they get to the issue is of the utmost importance of actually being able to help them with that particular issue. And, and that's that's the basis of establishing the trust um, that you have there with the clients. Um, I think the other part is just letting them know that you're there and being consistent and showing up consistently. Because a lot of times you may have people who come in to help and they're there for a moment and then they're gone. But when you show up every month, whether as a volunteer or as an organization showing up monthly or biweekly or weekly, depending on where the clinic is located, and consistently providing those services, it helps to tear down those walls that even though clients have needs, um, a lot of times they're, they're not quick to, to let you in to deal with those needs. So showing that you're actually present there over an extended period of time is really important in being able to establish their trust um, that we have to establish in doing the work at CLCP. Thank you. Uh, you know, you talked a little bit about how you decided to work with veterans, but then you also had to design a fellowship project, um, which for our students, that's a fellowship project. You apply as a student with a funding organization. You pitch a project and ask them to fund you at the organization for a year or two. So Bob has an Equal Justice Works Fellowship. And can you talk a little bit about how you designed that project and how you did your outreach and the skills that made you a good fit for that? As I said earlier, um, I'm, I'm LGBTQ and, and the LGBTQ community is my community of interest, right? In terms of where I was gonna um, serve. And I just needed to figure out where, you know? And initially I kind of, was I, I still am very interested in homeless youth. That's where I started out. I become very, very conversant in the issue. Um, in, in a number of my classes, I you know, wrote papers and such and, and did a study. and. I decided to go out, you know, I, tried, I decided to wear a test. I tried to decide to use the clinical opportunities and the summers to go out and try it out. So I went out um, to a few events and whatnot and met homeless youth through True Colors. I guess my point with this is, is you got to find the right fit. Um, and I still, I still believe in the cause and all that. I just found that I didn't relate very well with kids, right? I mean, I don't dislike children, right? But, you know, I don't relate to them very easily. I'm an older person, I'm single. So I thought, you know, maybe that isn't quite the right fit. So then I, you know, that's, I was also looking at the veterans and that's how I kind of went in, you know, became, went to that kind of lane because I'm a veteran myself. I'm LGBTQ myself. And I served under Don't Ask, Don't Tell and, and put up with a lot of the crap, pardon my language, that the other, my, the other LGBTQ veterans did, albeit I was very lucky in that I was able to hide and make it through a career. So I found that I was you know, much more easily able to relate uh, to this um, constituency. So that's how I kind of ended up there. And, and also there was a great need, right? Uh, because you know, I kind of equated LGBT veterans with homeless youth 10 years ago, 
right? Before 2012, LGBTQ youth were actually were, were unknown, right? There were, there were, nobody really studied them. There were some, you know, feelers out there. Maybe this was going on. It wasn't until um, the US government decided to look into it. They discovered, you know, oh my God, look at all these, you know, homeless unaccompanied youth, many of whom are LGBTQ. I kind of thought that um, that might be the situation somehow with LGBTQ veterans. So I kind of had this hypothesis in my mind and I was doing a clerkship in New Jersey after I graduated. And I was looking around for, you know, what's gonna happen next. And um, I'm involved with the American Bar Association. I asked people and one of my uh, uh, people I work with was like, oh, you, you need to get a hold of source to plowshares. They're looking for, they're interested in, in, in you know, um, partnering with a fellow, you should approach them. So I did. And what happened basically is I, I got a call from one of the attorneys there, you know, kind of a first round interview kind of a thing. It was supposed to last like 10 minutes. We were on the phone for 40 minutes. We were, we were, we were starting tossing back and forth um, ideas. What about this? What about this? What about that? And we just started, we actually just kind of naturally started building the project right there on the phone. So I would say if you're going to do a project, you get your fellowship project, you need to find something that you're passionate about, something that you know something about as well, because you're going to, you know, need to be able to discuss it and, and share uh, what you know about it and get people to sign on. And they need to try to find a partner organization that, that you fit with well, that you can kind of do this uh, symbiotic kind of relationship with. And um, a lot of times there are organizations out there who have sponsored fellows, be they Equal Justice Works or um, what's the other one? Um, Independence and Scadden are two of the other Yeah, ones. that's right. Yeah, so they've had, they've had um, a lot of them have had some, um, they've done it before. So that's kind of how that happened. And then, you know, we, we just rolled right into it. We put in um, our project, we worked, long, we worked hard on it and we got picked up and I had to interview with a funder. Um, and again, since I'm, you know, if you believe in something and you know about it, it's kind of easy to talk about it. So when I got to the point where we had to, you know, find a funder because, you know, Equal Justice Works picks you, right? Once they pick you, that's, that's not over. You've got to find a funder. If you don't find a funder, you, you don't go. So when I did the, the interview with the funder, it was a very natural conversation again because I knew the subject matter and I was interested in it. So my, my point, I guess, is that whether you're going to go for a fellowship or you know, just be in this space, um, you need to have a, a passion for whatever the issue is, and you need to know something about it, right, to be able to define the problem at least. Okay, thank you. And Lauren, talk a little bit about for your position, what you think some of the strengths that fit with the job that you're doing and some of the things students should be looking for in themselves. Sure. Um, my answers aren't dissimilar from the other answers. I think that, like Bob said, having a passion and a commitment to your subject area is going to get you really far. And connecting with the folks in that area, even if they don't immediately have a job available, connecting with people, making connections, letting people know the sort of thing that you're interested in doing, even if it isn't a thing right now, can really help get you connected to what you ultimately end up doing. Um, and I think like the others said, having a client-centered approach to your work when you're working in public interest is so important. Um, when I was working both in reproductive health care and abortion advocacy, as well as now working in intimate partner violence, the person that I am working with knows their own situation far better than I ever will from the outside. They know what they are dealing with every day. They know what it takes to keep themselves safe. They know the person that, they're, that they have been hurt by way better than I ever will. And so my job is not to come in and tell them what the right answer is, what the right thing to do is here, go do it. My job is to come alongside and partner with them. And like Jamie said, listen to what they need, what they are saying they need to be safe or to access the care that they need and help find the avenues to make that happen. Um, your clients aren't always gonna make decisions that make sense to you, but they make sense to them. And so my job is to help them make informed decisions that make sense for them. 
and that can be really like that's a great idea in theory but it can be really hard when the rubber hits the road and your client's doing something that feels wild to you and you're like no this is dangerous don't do this right but that's where you have to really trust it and say, no, I gave that person all the information that they needed. And this is what makes sense for them at this time. And like Jamie was saying, create that trust so that even if they're not necessarily doing what you said, or in fact, sometimes going directly what you said, please, God, don't do this. They know that they can come back to you, that I deal with clients who are in crisis. For some of them, it's not like momentary. They've been in crisis for a really long time and it's not going to let up. And so that can be a really hard place to decision make from. And so expecting them to make beautiful, perfect, like it all makes sense decisions isn't reasonable. And so arming them with information and then saying, I'm here if you have other questions or other stuff comes up and really being there, really showing up, even when they have to come back to you and say, you know that thing you said I shouldn't do, I did that, can you help me now? But really showing up for them and like fulfilling that trust is enormous because so many of the people that we work with in public interest have been let down time and time again by systems. They've been either fallen through the cracks, they've been specifically ignored, they've been told their experience is wrong, and that is not what they need when they come to you. So having also some cultural competency for what your client is dealing with, if they are coming from, because they probably will be, coming from a really different experience than yours, I can't speak to that. Like for so many of my clients, I can't speak to their experience. And so I have to trust what they're telling me about their experience. It is not my place to say like, oh, I don't think that person meant it that way, or that doesn't sound like it makes sense to me because it's their experience and it's not my place to tell them their experience is wrong. And so I think really those things being like, I don't know, not to be too like kumbaya, but those things being really at the core of who you are and what you believe about practice is going to be pivotal. I can teach you to litigate. I can teach you how to write policy briefs. Like those are skills I can teach you, but I can't teach you to really care about someone with a very different life experience than you, who's going to make really different decisions, but needs you to meet them where they're at. Um, Bob, I had the pleasure of working with you when you were a student, and I know you did a lot of outreach and networking while you were a student. I wonder if you'd talk about some of what you did to explore that when you were at Drexel. Well, like I said, I did, I took well advantage of all the clinical experiences and co-ops and, and such. <clears throat> but I, again, I was in that exact position. You know, I want to do something. Where, where can I do it? How does this work? I don't know. Um, the turning point for me in law school was, I feel terrible. I forgot his name. He was a, a 1L when I was a 3L. And um, he's basically, for some reason, approached me. He goes, you know, the, um, the Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Commission of the American Bar Association is looking for a student liaison. And I'm like, student liaison, what's that? Well, basically you, 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 sit, you sit on the commission and you help out basically. And you are the official law student representative helping out on this, on this American Bar Association commission. And you go to the meetings and such. That was the best thing I ever did. So not only, not, and, then, and then I also, um, got connected to the Commission on Homelessness and Poverty at, on the American Bar Association. I kind of acted as a liaison between those two commissions, which kind of covered my two interest areas, you know, poverty, homelessness, and LGBTQ um, folks. And then, of course, veterans are in there too. And anyway, so not only did I learn a lot about um, the practice of law, the issues, but I also got connected with some very smart, um, dedicated attorneys. And like I said, that's how I found Source of Plowshares, which is my, my host organization, now my, you know, where I work. Um, I found them through my American Bar Association contact. So if, if, if you, even if you've never even thought about possibly, you know, getting involved with the ABA, I highly recommend it. I mean, it, it really is a great organization. Um, and it's a good time to do it too, because it's all being done, you know, cyber. So 
um, travel costs are kind of kind of low. Of course, there goes my dog. Shh, quiet. I have a dog. I'm at home. So anyway, uh, so that's that's how I did that. I, I found that getting out there and meeting people, making connections, uh, is very important. I want to open this to our other panelists. What are the things that you did while you were in law school that helped you connect? That helped you explore? Like Bob, I did all the things. <laughs> um, I had gotten some great advice ahead of time to really use your law school experience to try different stuff. I went into law school thinking I want to do direct client representation and that is it. Um, but also wanted to try stuff out. So I did a summer with the senior law center. I um, took a co-op with the Women's Law Project where I did um, impact litigation that is still litigation and technically working with a client, but it is far more reserved than direct client representation. It's taking cases that will impact a larger, usually will make a change in the law or enforce a change in the law. So you don't really deal with your client on a daily basis. Um, I took an internship doing policy work at the National Abortion Federation in DC and had the opportunity to try both national state work and federal policy work, which are very different animals. Um, and then did the community lawyering clinic for my, during my 3L year. So that was a little bit of both direct client representation and some like local advocacy policy work um, to get a feel for all of those things. And then I worked really hard to make connections at all of those places. I think all of the experiences that you have will inform figuring out where you want to go, that even if you don't love an experience, it still tells you, okay, that's not what I want. My problem was that I really liked all of them. <laughs> so then how do you choose? And so I pursued doing policy work, but while I was doing that, I really liked it, but I kind of felt disconnected from the people that I was serving. Um, and so I used the opportunity to network within my fellowship. So if you get a fellowship placement, it then opens up the alumni network to you. And most people I know who did a fellowship are really committed to their fellowship organization. Um, so mine, the Women's Law and Public Policy Fellowship Program, we shorten it down to Wifflepuff. And so even before I was a Wifflepuff, I had heard how like once you're a wiffle pup, you always are. They're always there for you. And I thought it was part of the like, no, join us speech. And then when I got in there, it was really true. And so all of the local alumni were willing, like came to events, were willing to talk to us. And that's when I started talking to some people about litigation and saying, you know, I like policy, but something's missing for me. I think I want to do litigation after all. But I hadn't done any litigation in law school. I didn't do other than um, impact litigation, but I didn't take trial ad. I did law review and not moot court. Um, but I got a lot of encouragement that if you're interested, now's the time. And then the connections that I had made in law school helped connect me to women against abuse. So I would say really try all the things and talk to the people at all your placements. Even if that isn't your ideal job, talk to them about what you're interested in because they probably know someone who does something similar and if you've made a good impression there they're excited to like pass you on to someone else to get you into the field that you're looking to be in i want to talk to the panelists um the public interest community uh sometimes because we want to do good um doesn't always mean you are and you know lauren you had touched on that a little bit about being aware of um, your client's uh, perspective and understanding what you don't know about their background and their experience and being led by that and trying to be informed. I'm hoping we can talk now a little bit about bias, um, both you know, being aware of your own biases and also how you are making others aware um, of their biases and you know, what you do to kind of uh, you know, just hold that awareness and make sure that it doesn't affect clients and the community. Uh, Rosa, since your work is directly in that area right now, I'd love if you would talk a little bit about that. 
Sure, so I can talk a little bit about what I'm currently doing and then at the school district as well. So um, what I currently do, as I said, is I um, investigate allegations of discrimination and harassment that occur at the university. So that's everything from um, student to student conduct to faculty to student conduct. Um, and that could be everything from discrimination based on race to sexual harassment. Um, and so what happens is, is when a complaint comes in, um, we are tasked with doing um, a full and complete investigation if that's um, if the situation rises to that level. Um, and so that would entail um, reaching out to individuals for witness, uh, reaching out to witnesses, um, you know, obtaining information, evidence from different offices as far as maybe like discipline records. Um, and really trying to gather as much as we can to really come then to a conclusion and some recommendations for um, the designated um, office or individual um, that is the respondent, the person that's done the wrongdoing allegedly. Um, so um, some of the ways that we um, work to combat those issues is by doing training. Um, and we feel that that's a very proactive way to handle these issues and concerns. And so there's a whole office um, of um, diversity, equity, and inclusion that specifically is designated to support the work that we do in doing training. Um, some of the other things that um, the university is doing um, and which I'm working on is a council of all of the diversity, equity, inclusion liaisons for the different colleges um, and offices um, throughout Temple University to come together jointly um, and really have um, not only like a their own professional development, but have ways to that they can share out what they're doing in each individual college. Um, and so that's something new that Temple is working on to really try to promote diversity and even learn from our colleagues what we're doing. Um, and then with the work at the school district, um, you know, dealing and working in an urban school district um, is um, you know, definitely something that not everyone has an understanding or comes in with an understanding of how to deal with or work with that population of students. And so um, I think that for one, doing, um, you know, implicit bias and making sure that people are understanding what their own biases are and how it may impact the decisions that they make, especially as it pertains to discipline. And that was a lot of the work that I did. Um, so I did a lot of training while I was there on implicit bias and the impact that it has on discipline, um, specifically in the minority population of students. And so um, teaching people how to make decisions that are rational, that are thoughtful, and that are not um, snap decisions and um, really helping people to think through um, what these children's past experiences might have been and how it may impact their behavior. Um, was really important. So that was really a focus um, while I was there. And like I said, I did a lot of training um, on those kind of specific areas, just making sure that people are aware of that. And then um, I also did a lot of advising. So schools would reach out and they would say to me, you know, this student brought a weapon to school. Like, how do I handle this? And, you know, then I began to probe, kind of like put my attorney head on and ask a bunch of questions, you know, well, why did they do that? You know, were they fearful or not? Um, or, you know, was there some sort of hidden motive as to why they did it? You know, what's going on at home? Does, what did mom say or dad say when you told them that, you know, and really trying to dig deep and figure out why the student's behavior, um, you know, uh, was an issue and what we can do to kind of support them in a progressive discipline sort of manner. So, um, so yes, I think that that training um, and really trying to make people aware of the decisions that they're making is really important. Bob, can I get you to talk a little bit about this and how you address it and some of the work you do? I'll start off by talking about uh, something that Sewer to Plowshares does, where I work, I think is important that I first didn't give much you know, I didn't think much of, um, but I, in retrospect, it actually, I see why and it's very effective. Specifically, at every staff meeting, we end the staff meeting with um, talking about cultural humility, right? I'd never heard the term cultural humility before. I thought, at first I thought they were joking. I thought it was like to play on words or something. Um, you know, cult cultural competency is what I'm used to hearing, but no, they were serious about this. And I soon learned that it's, it's, Using that term is to remind you to think about yourself, right? Being humble um, in your own culture, knowing that your, your culture is not the end all beat all and that other people have very different life experiences based on, on where they come from and what their lives have been. And it, every time 
it's time for that in a staff meeting. Ha hearing that term, cultural humility, it just reminds me of that. And that's kind of important because you know, I, I was in the military, I'm a veteran and I'm LGBTQ. Um, and, I and I can relate quite a bit to my clients, but I'll tell you the truth when it comes to privilege. I mean, if this, if this is like the top of the, of the privilege, you know, of the food chain, right? Um, I'm, I'm a white male and I successfully hid uh, my sexual orientation for 20 years, right? So this is the top of the human food chain. I'm like right here, right? And then other people are, but you know, have, have, it, have had it much worse than I do and have very different experiences. And I have to you know, remind myself of that. So I don't, you know, judge, I'm not judgmental. I'm not patronizing, you know, for, uh, you know, for instance, I have a number of clients. I have a number of African-American transgender women veteran clients, right? So just as an example, you know, they're in the military. They have to deal with the fact that they're being perceived as, um, you know, being gay, right? So they're dealing with, with that uh, stereotype and, and that discrimination, right? Um, then on top of that, I've had a number of clients also experience racial discrimination at the same time, intersectionality. And on top of that, they're dealing with being transgender, right? So these people's lives experiences are much different than mine. I have to be cognizant of the fact that when I deal with them, that that's true, right? And then that my experience is not what everyone else has gotten. Um, and that's, that's kind of the way that I uh, approach things. Now, it, you know, the fact that I do have some commonalities with these folks, but I have experienced some of what they've been through in terms of harassment, discrimination, et cetera, et cetera, um, allowed, and the fact that I had to hide for 20 years, that gives me a commonality, right? That opens, that a lot of times opens conversations that um, they're not willing to have with other attorneys. But they're, I, I, I put, don't, don't look at it now, I put uh, a couple of my flyers for my project in the, the chat uh, so you can see. And there are several times where we have, we do intakes weekly, at least when we were <laughs> in the office, and we have, you know, they have open door, people would come in and do intakes with us. And many occasions, somebody would be sitting with one of the other attorneys, they wouldn't even disclose that they were um, transgender or gay or, any, or bi or anything. And they would look over and see the flyer, just seeing the flyer, they felt comfortable expressing. And then all of a sudden, you know, they expressed what happened to them, and, you know, harassment, sexual assault, things they weren't, things they would not talk about otherwise. And all of a sudden, and that and that helps that that point when that when that becomes clear, it becomes much easier to help them, right? When when these these facts about them that they that they really are afraid to talk about come out, it really helps um, our ability to serve them. Um, one of the questions that came up was asking about that idea when you have a client and you've advised them on something and they then end up doing something that feels dangerous to you or that makes you worry. Um, that amidst some of the other challenges that come, how do you deal with some of the trauma and the stress around that? And Jamie, I'm going to ask you to start to talk about that a little bit. So you pray. Um, that's the way that I, I mean, personally, I deal with the 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 stress and, and the trauma around just clients making bad decisions or even dealing with the complexity of the client issues that come into our clinics. Every Monday during our staff meeting, we have a time of devotion and a time of prayer. And it's really an opportunity to lay all your burdens down and, and to get re-energized, to go in and, and face what's ahead of you for the rest of the week. Um, and then the other is the reminder is that we have our limitations, right? I am not God. I cannot be the God to my, my clients. I, all I can do is be an attorney and advise them as to what they they should do. And there are times where because of, of my heart and because of just how we function at CLCP, we have gone beyond just the role of attorney for clients. I had one client where I was so, she was, oh, this close from being reunified with her kids, right? this close. We just needed her to stick with her program. And she was history of, of drugs and mental health. And something happened and she went over the edge. And I, I put my mother in the car and we went and picked her up from, from where she was to go take her to get care. But in the end, she still went back out to the streets. 
And so, you know, I wouldn't do that for everybody. And I would not advise anybody to do that for everybody. But this particular client was this close. Um, but I recognize that these are choices that she has made in her history, right? I, I've only been a part of her life for, for just a, a very finite period of time. And there's so much trauma that she's experienced in her life that the period of time that I was there wasn't going to change everything that she had experienced and the way that she coped with the hard places in life. And so in that space, right, I have to just respect the fact that it's hard, right? It's hard to see a client that's made so many strides and make a really bad life decision. It's really hard, but their life is far beyond. It started before they came to CLCP and it will continue after they leave CLCP. And so we trust that God's somewhere in the mix in, in their process that we have made some type of deposit in their life. And when they go their own way, we have to let them go. And, and we have to pray. That's what I, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I love my job is that we can all come together and we can, we recognize our limitations, right? That we are, you know, great at what we do, but we are still limited because we're still dealing with other human beings and that we can take it to some, to a power that is beyond us and trust that there will be another level of care that will go with our clients long after they leave CLCP. So that's, that's how we deal um, at, at CLCP. Thank you, Jamie. I appreciate that. I want to open it to the other panelists. Does anyone else want to jump in here about how you deal with that, with the, with the secondary trauma or the ability not to help every client on every issue? What are your outlets? Yeah, I could definitely speak to that, especially for the work that I did working at the city of Philadelphia. So as I said, I represented the city in family court um, in proceedings at, that involved the Children and Youth Agency. So what that looks like essentially is um, representing the social worker as a representative of the city in cases where children were abused and neglected. Um, and so every day, um, well, every other day, mainly going into court and having to, you know, advocate on what's best for these children, but seeing families and hearing the stories and having to bring the information to life via testimony, I mean, it's just, it's very draining. And I think that, um, you know, especially when you're talking about kids who, I mean, are like, severely malnourished or have been beaten beyond like anything you can ever imagine and having to um, kind of like um, almost be numb to those things which is almost crazy because it's every day all day is like what you're dealing with so I think in that regard one of the things that my fellow colleagues there really tried to harp on was making sure that you did self-care stuff like taking care of yourself um, and for me, I think the way that I did that was separating work from home. And so no matter how late I had to work, I left everything at the office and I didn't take work home because for me, my home was like my mental sanctuary and I didn't want to think about the cases that I had to deal with um, on a day to day or that particular day in court. Um, and so I think that that's very helpful. And I know now it's difficult because we're all working from home, but really trying to be able to separate like, okay, work is over. I'm gonna close the laptop or I'm gonna leave the files here and you know, spend time with my family or do something you know, to get my mind off of all of the difficult things that I had to deal with or discuss um, or you know, to present in court today. So I think that that is really important. And you'll hear from a lot of public interest attorneys that some of the work can be draining. Um, and so, so um, doing a lot of self-care and, um, you know, self-restoration, taking time off is really um, important. That, those are the hard parts of being a public interest attorney, but there is a huge amount of satisfaction. And one of the student questions also was about how do you measure success? So, you know, I, I, how do you measure success? And which any of our panelists who want to jump in on that? I'll jump in. I'm going to say a couple things about secondary trauma first, and then I will talk about the successes. Um, one thing I think being in public interest is just being aware that secondary trauma is a thing. If you are working with trauma every day and part of your job is helping your clients rehearse that trauma to then spill it in front of the person who created that trauma, 
is really taxing. And so knowing that you are facing that and that that is a thing you're going to have to be aware of is like the number one first step. If you're aware of it and you're tackling it, that's great. My second big piece of advice is find a great therapist. <laughs> it's gonna really save you. It's gonna be well worth the money and it's gonna really help you with that boundary setting of home versus work and what is mine to take on as an attorney and what is outside of my control. Because like Jamie said, I can't be everything to that person. I'm just their attorney. And sometimes it's tempting to be everything to that person, but you got to really hold those boundaries firm, even when it feels like you're doing something mean. Um, in terms of measuring successes, I think that's another side where being client-centered really comes in. That for me, success isn't like, did I win the case and get all the things I wanted as an attorney? Did I get to make that argument and have my like boom moment? That those are fun, don't get me wrong. But the way I measure success is, did I meet my client where they were at? Did they feel supported by my representation? And did I help them achieve their goal, right? My client is the one determining what the goal is, and my job is to help us get there. And so what my goal, like looking at a case as a lawyer, my what I want the goal to be is often very different than what the client's goal is, right? Because they have to live in their life. So for me, I got a case this week that I looked at it and was like, oh, you can get sole physical and legal. Here's all this stuff. We'll get you sole custody. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait to make this argument. And my client was like, no, I just want to make an agreement. Like, I want him to have time. Here's the agreement that I want. And we had a really hard conversation of, uh, of me saying, you're waving a lot. You're giving up a lot by agreeing. And she was like, nope, this is what I want. This is what I know is right for me and for my kids. And so that's where as an attorney, I don't live her life. She does. She knows what works for her family and what keeps her safe and what keeps her kids safe. And me fighting hard to get her soul might actually make things a lot more dangerous for them. And so I have to just listen to that. And so putting myself aside and like the arguments that it may be fun for me to make, but helping this person achieve their goals that when your client, I have had cases that I just lost. I had like one of my worst ones, I got blindsided because there's not discovery in PFA. I got blindsided. I lost really bad. It was really frustrating. We left the room. I was fully ready for my client to fall apart. And she was like, well, you know, basically said, I didn't see that coming, but they have a fair point. And she ended up saying that she felt supported by me, that yeah, it wasn't the outcome she wanted, but she really felt like she had somebody in her corner and somebody to hear her out and like, just be next to her who had her back to do a hard thing and speak up for herself. That in the end, what really mattered was having the opportunity to say, this person hurt me and I'm not willing to accept that. And that was like, right? Not the outcome that I had expected as a lawyer. It wasn't, I felt gutted by being blindsided and like losing my case horrifically, it felt to me. But my client left feeling good about the experience. And then that means I did my job. Like you can't count it by wins and losses because that's not what we're here for. If my clients feel supported and seen and their help like further down the road towards their goals, then I've done my job as I see it. And then the other question was, what do you think about people who are interested in public interest work getting their MSW or how else are they going to pick up some of those skills in terms of the client counseling piece, you know, the understanding other people's perspective? I'm jump in on that because I do know a lot of um, MSWs who worked um, at the school district um, and so who also had a JD as well. And so I think that, um, you know, um, is it needed? I don't necessarily think it's like a required thing to work in public service, but I think it can only help. And I think that um, the aspect of working with clients um, and really being of service to them and being open to, um, you know, 
the different issues and the traumas that they're facing, a lot of times you can get that that aspect through, um, you know, a, a social work program. Um, but there are a number of opportunities even to volunteer, like doing pro bono work. I did a lot of pro bono while I was at Drexel and really getting those opportunities to service clients and be in the community and really doing the work is also another great way that you can still get that same skill set. Um, so, but the people that I know got the MSW first and then decided to go to law school. And of course they can't do legal work without a JD, but um, you know, I think it's helpful, but not necessarily required. I just wanted to reiterate um, Susan's point about it feeling like home. Um, that was kind of the same experience that I had when I came to Accepted Students Day. And I think that, um, you know, I felt like Drexel is like a large family and that even still to this day, I keep in touch with a, a small group of people that graduated the same year as I do. And we do a holiday dinner and we have a group chat and we really check in on people. And I think that sometimes we forget, especially in like a graduate level program that the people you go to school with will eventually become your colleagues, will become the people that, you know, will help you to network with other people and maybe get opportunities and jobs. So see them as colleagues even before or while you're in school because um, that's what they will become after you graduate, so. Rosa, that's such an incredible note to end on. Let's end right there. For our current students, I wanna say if you're interested in the fellowships and some of the other opportunities, reach out to me at CSO or any of the other CSO counselors and watch, we'll be doing a fellowship um, panel later this spring to talk to you about developing fellowship ideas and how to create those. And to all of our panelists, thank you so much for your time and for the work that you're doing in our communities. I'm just so grateful that we have people like you. So thank you very much.